Welcome to Live Free, Ride Free, where we talk to people who have lived self-actualized lives on their own terms and find out how they got there, what they do, how we can get there, what we can learn from them, how to live our best lives, find our own definition of success, and most importantly, find joy. I'm your host, Rupert Isaacson, New York Times best-selling author of The Horse Boy, founder of New Trails Learning Systems and LongRideHome.com. You can find details of all our programs and shows on RupertIsaacson.com. Welcome back to Live Free, Ride Free, where we talk to people who lead lives of self-determination and fulfillment, and we find out how they got there. And as you know, the way in which we define this fulfillment, this live free, ride free, can be many things. It can be money. It can be art. It can be simply doing what you love. It can be all of the above. It can simply also be life as an art form in itself. What is fulfillment? What is the nature of living life on your own terms with this degree of self-determination that we all have as our ideal? So today, I've got the amazing John Mitchinson. John Mitchinson, it might be someone who's known to you without you knowing that he's known to you because he's one of these shadowy behind the scenes sort of chaps, unless you happen to meet him in a bar and then he's not behind the scenes at all. He'll be very jolly and probably buying you lots of drinks. John, I first met in the early nineties when he was my publisher and we became great friends. And he was then working for a small boutique publisher in London called Harville, which produced really, really good editions of books that sort of other people didn't really publish. And I would say that most of the books that I consider the best books I've read since I became an adult were recommended to me by John Mitchinson. So we're going to go into this a little bit today. And he then became publisher in larger companies, larger companies, larger companies. And then he did something rather unusual, um, which he's going to tell us about. He took a sidestep and began to pursue his interests. And one of those interests, many of you may know the TV show on both sides of the Atlantic called QI, quite interesting, presented by Stephen Fry. Well, that's a, a John Mitchinson idea. And there's other things as well, including his his current MO in the publishing world, which is Unbound, a return to subscription publishing, which has been wildly successful. John, however, is not an ostentatious guy who walks around saying, look at me, I'm so successful. If you were to meet him in his home village in the pub at Great Two in Oxfordshire, you would simply be overwhelmed by his warmth, charm, and just all-round sweetness. Yet he is one of the most effective human beings I have ever met, not to mention one of the kindest and most intelligent. So that's the intro. John, you've got to live up to it now. I was going to say, it's going to be downhill from here for your listeners, I'm afraid. Well, you know, at least we're not in the pub. Very, very, very nice. Very kind of you to to introduce me. So, Well, it's only the truth, John. So I want you to tell us who you are, where you came from, where were you born, And how did you get on the road to where you are now? Ah, okay. Well, I think most people, I don't know, I I guess there are people who have a life plan and kind of latch onto something very early and and end up doing doing the thing that they feel that they were destined to do. Not sure my life's ever been quite like that. In fact, there's only one thing that I would say that's really been a, a a kind of a, a through line through all the activity um, that I've engaged in and what we have to now, as I about, I'm about to turn 60, you kind of have to call it your life now. You know, it's beginning to have, it, it, it certainly had a beginning and it certainly had a middle and at some point increasingly one gets the sense that it will have an end. So, so the, the through line for me has always been, I guess, primarily reading and as a consequence of reading then books that kind of a, a, a from a very early age i grew up it's born well it's an here's an interesting story i suppose that my origins are slightly complicated in that my my parents had 
been teaching in India and came back into my dad was worried my mum f- fell pregnant they'd had an amazing 18 months out there but my dad who is now 87 told me just a few weeks ago he's 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 kind of he is definitely very close to the end of his life and is i think suffering from he's suffering from dementia so his short term memory is 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 pretty poor but his it means he spends more time talking about the past and he told me that that 18 months with my mother in India had been the central event of his life. And, but he, my dad's got a very, has a long record of sometimes of making perhaps on one level brave, but sometimes perhaps other people would think strange or even foolish decisions because he gets, he was such a stress, stressful person, very anxious person. And again, in his own way, very inspiring and, and, and an interesting man. But he decided he couldn't have my mum having a baby in India. So they came back. So that the first thing was that they came back into a really grim winter than the winter of 1963. Oh, 62, 63 was... Oh, the historic one. Yeah. Was a historically poor winter. They were living in a very, in a very kind of rundown little house in Chingford, teaching. And I think you get get the sense that the the dream that they had shared in India, living in this extraordinary hill station, teaching this teaching in this wonderful school, suddenly they were back. Kind of the reality principle had kicked in. It's a, it's a it's a it's a very interesting thing to go back to your your origins like that because I realised that my my life began at a very low moment in for, for my parents, and then my, <clears throat> the story goes, which I haven't I, I can't really now test out. I suppose I can ask my mother, which would be interesting. So my, my grandparents came and rescued them and invited them up to come and live in their tiny little council house in Sunderland, which they did for almost a year. And the reason I give you that this origin story is I, I think it is always interesting, the emotional, the emotional kind of sort of timbre of the life that you are born into. Mm. which I think for my parents was, was, as I say, was, was not massively happy. The good Born thing for me was when I, as basically. yeah, anxiety and then when, and, and financial anxiety, and professional anxiety. And I'm in many ways, I'm not sure their marriage, they, they separated 30 years later, but I'm not sure their marriage entirely recovered from it, from this incredible halcyon kind of golden period in India. And my dad's been back several times to India. My mum hasn't. But two things, it left me with a, with, a, with a fascination, which I've, one of my major fascinations, which I've still never managed to fulfill, which is to go back to, to find a place. Yeah. I was always, you know, I was that kind of precocious kid who used to tell all my all guests, visitors to the house that I'd been conceived in the foothill, foothills of the Himalayas. <laughs> True, but I've, I've never been to actually see, as it were, the place. There are many things you have in, co- in, in common with the Buddha, as, as the lessons are going to find. So it, it, it's no surprise. <laughs> I didn't know this, that you and Prince Siddhartha had in fact been born. In the the Gautama, yeah. Perfect. Well, sentence. there you go. Yeah. I think I'm not sure whether, 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 whether the comparisons hold much further into my life. But the thing that living with my grandparents gave to me was my grandfather, who who I think was just at that moment in his 50s when he was I was just, a, you know, he became fascinated and, and we formed a bond, which I maintained throughout his life until he died sort of about 20, 23 years ago. But he was, the, he was my sort of mentor, my, I think for. What did he do? Uh, well, what he, he was, was a, he was a, a it's an, again, an interesting story. I'm, I'm, he was a highly intelligent now would have gone to university and probably studied maths. He he taught me he taught me sort of he showed me logarithmic tables when I was in about six years old, and he was a motor mechanic. But his you know a working class family, northeastern family, but he his his family had had a little bit more money than my grandmother's, who were very poor, and my great grandmother was Irish and. My great grandfather was one of twenty-two children, which is extraordinary. And it, uh, what, the nice thing about it is, I, I, there is now a, a Goodrick. He was a, his name was Charlie Goodrick, and there's, there are now regular family reunions up there. So I've met a whole load of people I might otherwise not have met. Anyway, 
he we now are pretty sure got my grandmother pregnant when she was a teenager and they had because they never celebrated their wedding anniversary my grandmother always always was extremely negative about the virgin mary which for people who were quite religious i mean they were they were they were stalwarts of their local Church, although it stalwarts in a very in a very kind of independent way, they were very they they they, they were not they weren't sort of lovey dovey Christians. My grandfather was 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 pretty critical of, of, of most of the the vicars that came. And weirdly, into this, in, my, my dad had left home at sixteen to become a monk. He'd gone joined a, a religious order. So there's Is that all of that going. On? Anyway, <laughs> I, bo- I bonded with my father and my grandfather, and that okay. was. And he was, as I say, he was a he was a source of calmness and validation for me during really right through my my kind of early childhood and into my teens, in a way that I suppose my father never had been really. My dad was was my dad was always out and doing stuff, and also my dad was a vicar, became weirdly a vicar, and he was standing up, being, you know, telling people how they live to live their lives, when. Let's be honest. Probably his own personal life was 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 in a was in a t- terrible mess. I mean, I say a terrible mess. He was serially unfaithful to my mother, which is not generally considered the 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 the, the path for a for a for a man of the cloth. So, so the northeast, that culture, working class northeast, was where that's. If people say to you, "Where are you from?" That's where I always think that's that's where I was formed, and there was much about that that I loved. The town of Sunderland is a was a you know a former shipbuilding and mining town. I mean, the shipbuilding it produced more tonnage than any other British port. Not it didn't build the big ships, but a lot of the merchant ships were built there. And that really, I watched that from the sixties, from my being born in early sixties through the seventies. Watched all that disappear. Ended up, of course, becoming a fan of their their football team. But that that's the. That was the crucible into which I was born. And then when I was eight years old, something happened, which I think has probably been the most, the thing that's probably most influenced me, which was we moved down to Banbury. And by that stage, I I was already reading my, reading kind of, you know, sort of ferociously going to the library. I remember early reading, reading all of Arthur Ransom. And desperately wanting to be in the Lake District sailing a dinghy or bird watching became the thing I was obsessed with. I was I used to go off. Now, I mean, where we were living in the northeast is a, is a little place called Hewarth, which is near Felling. It was not massively, you know, it, it, it was it was pretty built up, and it was late '60s, so it's pretty depressed. Still, lots of that area was bombed, fairly heavily bombed in the war, but there were these scrubby bits of waste ground. And I remember one amazing winter, there was an invasion of wax wings from Scandinavia. And I, I still have the little project. My mum was very much, you know, go out and thought, make a nature table. My mum was a very good teacher and remains a very, a very important person in my life. But she was traumatized, I think, by how, the, 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 how poor and difficult and depressed the, the, the area that we were living in was and the school was. But she made, she made all the other stuff fun. So I, I kind of grew up reading and fascinated by nature, particularly by birds. And then you was, moved down to rural Oxfordshire. Yes. Yeah, so then we moved down to Oxfordshire. Well, Banbury, Banbury was definitely, can you, Banbury was definitely, we weren't, we weren't, well, it was more rural than the, the Northeast. And every weekend we would go off and dis, discover new villages and as my brother and I got older, we would go off and explore and on our bikes, and and it was definitely deep. It but from there, I felt it was deep immersion in the English countryside, and I, mm-hmm. I I formed a a strange obsession with a village called Great Chew, which I visited for the first time, I think, in about 1972. So whatever that is, 50 years ago, right? Which is pretty remarkable of itself. The reason I formed a, a, a I, I guess, two reasons why it was so important to me. One. I'd been reading Tolkien and and then I discovered what I really wanted to do was to live. I felt that I really ought to have been born in the 12th century. And you wanted to live in the Shire, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then I suddenly found myself in the Shire. I mean, Great Chew, you can attest to this, is 
a remarkable place and it was even more in some ways remarkable it's always been remarkable but in the early 70s it was pretty it was semi-derelict there is no welcome to great shoe sign on the road there are no road markings there are no street lights it's it's thatched in the early 70s the thatch was all kind of falling apart it felt like a a village that was sinking back into the earth Mm. and i remember going there and indeed going there with my grandfather who came to visit once and sitting in the church there next to him and being amazed that the, the, the church is an incredibly beautiful building, amazing 12th century wall painting, and, a, and surrounded by trees, surrounded by greenery. So the idea of a sort of green church kind of seemed to me to be that pagan to bring, together, to bring together everything yeah. that I was interested in, a kind yeah. of sense of history closeness to nature i I mean we later discovered obviously the church was a a much older site than the christian site it's a it's a dedicated to saint michael which usually means there was a a kind of a a, a, some form of saxon or earlier holy place there so that sort of deep connection with a kind of english landscape and countryside was was forged there and I, i think you know that when one remembers one's childhood those years between eight and 12 for me were those mm. were the kind of the magic years and and again fired by my reading but fired also by exploring the countryside i got given an ordnance survey map which was i i still remember i may even still have it, it was one of the old pink ones so for banbury in the area just the obsessive detail i'd go through every trying to work out and find on the map every little bit of yeah, you know every every old tumuli or disused bit of railway line, or that that idea that there was some order that you could find the, a, a kind of a way through this. That was that was massively important. The patterns of the story, the patterns of the past. Yeah. So then my dad made one of his, you know, the decisions that I've I've, I've referred to earlier. I think try I, I, always i think he's been trying to escape from things and this was the biggest one of all he decided he announced that we were going to move to new zealand he'd got up been offered a job in new zealand working with a a, a a couple of priests in a team ministry in rotorua friends of his who and suddenly at the age of 12 i found myself translated to the other side of the world completely different completely different place and I have to say, very at first, I found very difficult, but gradually came to came to. I made my peace with it, and it's after I suppose rural Oxfordshire, the kind of New Zealand, but feels like the other place that I and, and the northeast. It feels like the other place, but that's that's determined all sorts of outcomes for my life. My I married my first wife was a New Zealander. I went to, did a year did a year of university out there before I came back here. My brother lives there and my mother lives there. My daughter lives there. So it's, but when I arrived as a 12 year old, it was like everything was different. And some of that was exciting, but some of it was also, so it created in me a fairly profound nostalgia for what I'd left behind. And Great Chu in particular played a role in, so you know that thing when I said people who who have a plan for their lives. I've never had a professional plan for my life, but I'd always thought that at one point or other I would maybe live in Great Chew, and I've now lived there for twenty six years. So sometimes, what's sometimes interesting to me things... that, that leaps out from that, I can indeed attest to the listeners. If you're looking for the Shire, it is Great Chew. It is that area of Oxfordshire. It is that thatch village, which hasn't really changed much outwardly since the 17th century. And it has a real magic to it. But what's ironic to me that leaps out is that there you were looking for the Shire. You find it, of course, in England. And then yes. um, you get thrown to the place that years later, Hollywood yes. decides is the Shire. But it doesn't appear to you as the Shire at all when no. you go there. No. It gives you only nostalgic for your Shire. So no, maybe, um, maybe that's what we're all doing is looking for that Shire. Yeah. Well, I think there is a kind of, there is the, the interest, isn't there, for all of us to try and find a mode of, mm. a mode of living where we feel, you know, that we, I remember once saying to Rachel, my wife, that, you know, we put down roots 
in Chew because I'd never had any. Mm. And she said, well, I'm not sure I want to have roots. And I think we both subsequently realized that because we had my daughter Stella was 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 born in London, but my three boys were born in 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 well, they were born in the hospital in Oxford, but they were all born into the village. There is that sense of there there is a some something fulfilling comes out of that sense of being in a place for the for for an extended period of time. And I would say that it's not necessarily always easy. I think Great Chew is superficially the people who see only the the picturesque and really don't understand the history of what these small villages in England have to offer. That they're almost always the records of sub, sort of, of 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 periods of massive investment of people, particularly people who've made a lot of money elsewhere in the world, trying to trying to realize their dreams for better or for worse. I've always said that although Chew is tiny, you know, there's only 150 people on the electoral roll, it's it's had a, a small but important part of the of the three great, what we might call the three great moments in British history, the Norman Conquest, the Civil War, or the three, War of the Three Nations, and the Industrial Revolution. It also, like all English villages we begin to see, has definitely got, you know, one of the people who owned the estate was a, East India Company Nabob, so there's the link with Empire. Matthew Bolton obviously was was you know the the, the architect of the Industrial Revolution, like the the Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk of his I day. I don't think many listeners would know that. Talk talk to us about that. So let me just give a little background here. So this village of Great Tew that John lives in, um, which does indeed look like the Shire, is an estate village, and one of the reasons yep. it, it 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 has this very picturesque look is that it's still owned by effectively a feudal estate, which limits the development, which keeps the look of the landscape and so forth. But this great house that is there, what changed hands, the, 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 the seigneurs of the estate had changed hands. And this chap Bolton, you say he was an architect of the industrial revolution, which of course well, is not the le- look of that landscape at all. Tell us about this man and 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 how well, so, so, the world. Uh, Matthew Matthew Bolton. I mean, it was in fact his son who 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 bought the estate, but they were uh, Matthew Bolton was James Watt's business partner. James Watt invented the, the 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 steam engine, which was the kind of the the bit of technology that unlocked the massive profits of cotton. The massive pro- profits of cotton, uh, as we now know, were also deeply implicated in the slave trade so that the cotton that was being grown in 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 the, in the south of america was 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 the product of slavery and that was being shipped back to to the uk but the the the, the technology that enabled the building of mills in 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 the north of england was very largely because of the business prowess james watt was the scottish engineer Bolton was the businessman, and the Soho foundry in Birmingham, which was his home, was is generally felt to be one of the one of the key sites of the Industrial Revolution. Certainly, the the kind of the monetizing of the inventions. You know, there are lots of people get hung up about who was it who invented what, when, but you know, it's a it's a little bit like once the technology is there, who's the smart person who can turn it into into a, into a, a business, and that was what Bolton did. And his son bought bought Chew Park, as it was then, in the 1820s and turned it into a extremely successful farm. And that passed down through his through his two son and grandson. And then the line failed in the early 20th century. And there were two there were two basically old dowagers, the Miss Robs, who lived in the Bain House and the the, the, the Chew's decline, the, when I found it, in, you know, seventy years later, really began at the turn of the twentieth century, when it was administered by the public trustee on behalf of the Miss Boltons who lived in the big house. And at that point, lots of the tenant farmers, I think, just started to say they were making no money, as is the want for tenant farmers, and there was little investment. And then in the nineteen fifties, when the Miss Boltons died, a, a really extraordinary man called Major Eustace Robb who was a m- member of the Bolton family, a not direct descendant of, of Matthew, but he took the estate on 
with very little capital. He, in fact, had been he'd been in the army, but before that, he'd been one of the early producers for Logie Baird at the very early BBC. That the turn that the, the, I mean, one of some of the very earliest TV programs ever made were produced by him. And then, in I guess in his sixties, he decided he wanted to sink into into sort of retirement. He'd always loved Chew. He'd he'd visited his his aunts there when he was a child. He was gay, although that probably wasn't the word he would have they would have used then. And he lived and sort of presided over. He didn't he wanted to retain that quality of an estate village. And then in the nineteen sixties, he there was the government decided they wanted to try some open cast iron ore mining on Cow Hill, which you'll know, Rue, where we we, we love to walk. Cow Hill. It's one of the most beautiful so hills he, in England. He employed a London lawyer called James Johnston to come and help him fight the case, and they won. And then he invited James to stay on to be the... To stop uh, them from mining it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, to stop them from mining it. So they won, and he invited James to stay on and be uh, help help him run the estate. And from that moment, small bits of, of, of development were made. There was a new sewage system put in, and some of the cottages were restored. But, but many of them had fallen into such bad disrepair that they were... They were sort of compulsory preoccupied rather than a state owned, although still it's roughly about 75% owned by single estate. And the, the, that estate has been a single estate. It's not been broken up since the time of the doomsday book, the sort of Norman conquest, which from Odo of Bayer. That's a thousand years, chaps. Yeah. That, yeah. So Odo of Bayer, William the Conqueror's half brother, was given the estate of Great Chew back at the time of the, the, the big deal doling out. And as I say, it's had various owners since then, but remains now, the major left it to James Johnston. And it's now Nicholas Johnston, who is who runs the estate incredibly successfully, and who was absolutely there on Saturday when we had our coronation party. And I would say that what's if 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 Chu had it's this strange kind of zelig like ability to to appear at various moments of English history, having something interesting to say about those things. So, you know, as I said, Civil War, when I should say in the Civil War, that there was an amazing group of intellectuals and artists who gathered around Great Chew, known as the Great Chew Circle. Lucius Carey, who was Charles I's Secretary of State, kind of had an open house come sort of almost like a sort of open air university he ran. Um, and a lot of the thinking, I mean, they didn't manage to, they weren't able to prevent civil war, but when the 1688 constitution was was finally in, in place with the, the, the restoration, the monarchy being restored, and then in 1688, we invited the Dutch to come over and run the show. The establishment of the parliamentary democracy that we know today that happened really in 1688. And a lot of those ideas came from People, members of the Chew Circle, like Edward Hyde, Lord Clarendon, and so on. So, again, bizarre. And now, our small village seems to be at the epicenter of what you might call celebrity culture. We have the Beckhams at one end, Claudia Winkleman down in the valley, and up on the hill, Simon Cowell. And Soho Farmhouse is, is in Great Chew Parish, which so the village now massively seems to be I mean, it's it still retains its its kind of its its core character, but again, there are people who obviously you can imagine loathe this. But I try and take the long view on these things and think, well, it's just Chu doing what Chu does. It always seems to find a way to be relevant. There Indeed, are lots, I, it, it lots sort of, of really dull villages out there in England, and you know where people are just sort of whiling away their lives and, 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 and not saying boo to a goose. She's never been like that. Yeah. And it, the England now is there's, it's having this renaissance as, as a sort of a media hub. Yeah. And so, and, and, and so it seems to make sense that where you live in this village that looks like the Shire, but is in fact, as you say, has this relevant, the story of, of relevance who pops up now at this later stage of, of what Britain is 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 exporting, which is the sto- which is its story. And you, you've told us this story of a little bit of yourself and the place you live. What stands out here is 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 John. It's 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 your love and ability to connect with and relate stories. And this, yes. of course, is how you have made 
your way in the world. Tell us how you've been telling stories and enabling other people to tell stories in a way that has brought you to where you are now. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I think I am, I think I'm a, I, I, I think I, I vacillate between and continue to vacillate between being a storyteller and a story enabler in that I am both a writer and a publisher. And while there are times when I have been more of a writer than I am a publisher and more of a publisher than I'm a writer, I don't think there's ever been a time when I haven't done either. I suppose there was a time when I was a, but when I started my very first job, I mean, very briefly, my very first job, I worked as a barman in a very busy, quite famous restaurant in Oxford. Most of my undergraduate years when I, was, I read English language and literature at Merton College. And why did I go to Merton College? Because that was Tolkien's college. And it was, it's whatever any of the other colleges say, it's the oldest. It's certainly the oldest, it has the oldest physical buildings in Oxford, I think. And I loved that mob quad, which is the, the, the central quadrangle, was so old it didn't even have chimneys. So I, that was my, that was where I went to college and I worked in a bar there called Brown's, a restaurant for Brown's. So when I came out of there, I, my first job was working in a nightclub in Oxford called, in London called Legends. And my, the what? plan had been, the plan had been to, to, to open a club. Were you, were you a male dancer or what were you doing? I wasn't, no, I was just working, I was head barman. So I was mixing, I've always liked, I've always, I've always liked making drinks. I had noticed. Yeah. So, and it was very, those days, I mean, it's nothing like the kind of extraordinary Baroque mixology you have today, but we were making, it was the eighties and we thought we were making great classic drinks, but nobody came. And the maitre d' and I, a lovely man called Mel Palmer had found a site in, in Beak Street in Soho. And we thought we were going to open a something that would have been halfway between a nightclub, a English pub and a, and a, and a, and a kind of the kind of bar you find in Spain or Italy. And we'd even managed to raise money. And, but this was 1987, which was the first of the several financial crises, which my life has, has, and every, uh, the person who was going to put money in got wiped out and said, sorry, boys, I can't do it. So at that point I had been I just got a job. A friend of mine from college had said, Hey, you should come and work in this bookshop. It's great. It's called Waterstones. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's really nice work. You know, you don't have to stay up till four in the morning. Nobody tries to pick fights with you or you don't have to, 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 to try and haul them, haul them out of the toilets for, for taking drugs. So I started work on an insanely low salary. I mean, it was like under five grand a year working in a bookshop. And then suddenly I thought, was Waterstones, oh, Waterstones, by the way, for those listeners who don't know, is, is a major, major chain of books, booksellers in the UK. At this stage, John, was it just one store? No, there were, there were, I think by that stage, there were 10 stores. Okay. So it, this was in 1987 and they started in 82. And then a, a extraordinary series of coincidences, really. I, I was working there and I have to say, although it was terrible pay and I was living in a, a very small studio flat in in with my now wife Simone in in Finsbury Park I absolutely loved the work and and I things that I loved about it were that you could more or less take any book you wanted to read home which I did and getting proof copies I remember the first proof copy was from the Galantz rep and it was mort by Terry Pratchett and I was just was I was so intrigued by this idea that you were get you were getting to read a book before it was even published. I, was, I still remember it with a sort of blue cover, and I read it and was incredibly enthusiastic. I think he I think the rep was rather touched that that somebody was so excited to be given one. So he gave me loads, and so I was I was buying sci for science the science fiction section and the fantasy section about which I knew a bit, but not not masses, but soon got to know. But you had more. been an early, an early Tolkien reader. You did have a. Oh um, yeah. And, and also I just, I remember there was some exciting Clive Barker's Hellraiser came out at that, that time. And I remember there was a, there was a, there's a guy called Piers Anthony who wrote these space opera books. And I think maybe even, yeah, I, it was, it was fun. And Pratchett was beginning to become really, really successful, but it was, it, 
like all these things, it was just fascinating. The, the Waterstones way was to very much throw you in at the deep end and you had to figure out what to buy and what not to buy and what to subscribe. All the buy, you know, we did all our buying in the store and even someone as inexperienced as me within a few months was buying books. So the excitement of buying 10 copies of something and then selling them, that's, I think that's been part of my DNA as well. I, that's something I find still thrilling. I, I love being in bookshops. And I love selling. I love selling things to people. What now gets called hand hand selling? You know, it's just that thing of getting somebody enthused, saying try it and let me know and come back. And I've got plenty more where that came from. So it was a bit, that was a bit of a revelation. It was, as I say, appallingly paid. This is a bit of a theme of my life: appallingly paid but massively satisfying. <laughs> and then, and then I met someone in the street who I'd I'd known from college, and she said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm working at Waterstones." She said, "Oh my god, I'm just at head office at Waterstones, and we're looking for somebody to edit our literary diary. Would you be interested?" And I said, "Well, what does it involve?" She said, "Well, I don't know. Six weeks' work. You have to go and sit in the British Library and find out interesting literary facts." So, I like to think that that moment which of course i said yes and i was paid a i remember a one-off bonus of 1500 pounds which just like that just seemed like the most staggering amount of money at the time you could um, actually afford to eat incredible and then a, 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 and then yeah week. and then yeah. i got to, to sit in the british library every day in that amazing reading room mm. that where marx had worked and 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 ordered up amazing old books and found lit, out literary facts and and it was commissioned essays. It was it was really, it was commissioned some poetry for, from people. That was, you know, it was quite, a, there was a desk diary and then a little pocket diary. So, and what happened was I then got kind of sucked into a thing called the Waterstones Guide to Books. We were trying to do what I once described as a paper Amazon, which was 60,000 annotation, annotated blurbs to 60,000 books in print. And that was that was really my first kind of exposure to the world of books and authors and and we although we we made a we made an astonishing 1500 page book that was significantly too large as a mail order catalog to go through anybody's letterbox so it ended up being a bit of a white elephant a sort of magnificent white elephant and at the end of the that year i was asked to take over running the public, what was then the, the the publications department, and then a year after that, Waterstones did a deal with W. H. Smith, and by that stage, I'd become quite good friends with Tim Waterstone, the owner, and he asked me to be his marketing director at the age of of twenty six. And I still remember he sent he he wrote he he, he Tim was a very early adopter of the post it note, and he always wrote in pencil, and he sent me he said that that's what I'm going to pay you, and. He'd written thirty pounds on a on a, and I remember looking puzzled. And he said, "Is that is got a problem?" I said, "Is it well, just one off?" Or and he looked it back and then put a K on the end of it. So, <laughs> in nineteen, what, what what year would it have been? My God, yeah, I mean, it was it was nineteen eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine, nineteen eighty nine to suddenly being be. I mean, thirty thousand pounds a year was a lot of money in those. It was days. back then, yeah. And that was that was my entry, I suppose, into a pretty extraordinary period. I did I was marketing director until for five years, nearly six years, and the Waterstones expanded massively. I mean, they had already been jammed together. We went from we opened fourteen shops in nineteen eighty eight and then in nineteen eighty nine we merged with the Sheraton Hughes, they all became Waterstones. So suddenly Waterstones had you know, eighty bookstores, and and became the biggest the biggest book specialist book retailer in the UK. And I was in charge of their marketing, knowing nothing about marketing. So, but that was, yeah. As I say, you kind of you kind of learn on the job. And, and I guess what is marketing but telling stories? And what had you been doing? Since well, you were the thing, what I, what I, yeah, you're completely right. And what I'd been doing was helping Tim write speeches. We basically, Tim and I sort of invent, invented a, a way of describing the Waterstones brand, which you had to do because we had to tell a lot of people who were being told that their shops were being turned into Waterstones what that meant. And right. well, whereas Tim had sort of had the idea of 
these large stockholding books. He'd been to America and been to the Strand Bookstore, and he, what he basically wanted was, could you take a big American bookshop, a Barnes and Noble, and a and, and a and a brilliant bookshop like John Sando in Chelsea, and turn it into a chain? And he'd been at his his background was W. H. Smith, and I think they fired him, which was why he when he finally sold the business back to them for a huge amount of money, it was particularly satisfying. That was his story. So we were absolute marketing is absolutely storytelling and it's storytelling. What I like about it is it's storytelling that can often have a measurable result of, you know, rapturous applause at a live gig or just, you know, your kid saying, can you read it to me again? I love that. Can you read it to me again? Which, so that was, and then from there, I suppose the next move was to go into publishing. I went, ended up at Harville. I'd fallen in love with the Harville list. Now that's as... a question because, so you went from something majorly commercial, Waterstones, okay, admittedly relatively highbrow, but Harville, which published me back in the day as well a bit, was anything but commercial. It was, so wh wh why yeah. and how? Well, I suppose we thought it, I suppose this part of me that is, you know, maybe my life is a is 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 thinking about drawing themes. I've always believed in quality. That ultimately, what lasts is 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 something that, that the the higher, the richer, the more complex, the more the more challenging something is, the 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 the, the more likely it is to last, to stand the test of time. And I think what I could see with the Harville list was something that had been, we would now you say curated, but we were probably in back in the nineties, just have said, you know, kind of built or chosen with such care and mm -hmm. intelligence that, that actually the people who, who, you know, who love reading and love literature and love the, 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 the transforming effect that, that reading something can make in your life. I think for, for those people that those kind of lists were, were and are incredibly important. The did taste. you know this about Harville before you went to work for them or did you discover? Yeah, no, I, I did. I, what I loved about them was they had a, they had a famous list of trade paperbacks with the, with the Collins Harville leopard on them. Yeah. And they were, they were kind of, they were always really beautifully typeset and they were kind of, they were, they were bigger than the average paperback and they were often in spinners and at the What's beginning a what well, a spinner is a is a sort of big plastic thing which which sits stands in bookshops and picador often used to come in spinners uh, they're right, much yes, they're I'm, much they're much sort of a standard they're, no, they're, they're not, not really thing. welcome in bookshops anymore but they were they were a good way of branding because you know oh, here's a publisher i like and collins harville was definitely a strong brand i think that's the thing for me really I realized that, you know, having spent so much time trying to define what made Waterstone special, that idea of a strong brand is still the thing that I, I go back to. That's as far as my marketing expertise goes, it's being able to articulate and communicate something, what makes a particular brand special and important and, and worthy of attention. So it's interesting uh, too, just for the, for the, for the listeners, I would say that Two of the most, the best books I've ever read, which is The Master of Margarita by Bulgakov and By Night Under the Stone Bridge by Leo Perutz, were both Harville books. So yes, when you talk about this quality, I, I remember just those two books alone were life changers for me. So I, w w was that what you saw? Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, it just a bit of the history, it was, it was. Harville was 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 the invention of two extraordinary women after the war, Manya Harari and Marjorie Villiers, which is Hart and Ville. And they were determined, I suppose, to that literature could prevent war. You know, it was a kind of it was a classic sort of post war nineteen late nineteen forties. And they were responsible for publishing the first English language version of Pasternak. Feltrinelli had published it in Italy and they got the English translation done. So it started with this idea that 
we, you know, if we read the literature of other countries, we're less likely to end up invading them. I mean, uh, uh, exactly. it's very crudest. And so that, and that had been developed through the, the, the 60s and into the 70s when really, truly remarkable publisher called Christopher McElhose had, had taken it over as whole, and he'd added other writers, George MacDonald Fraser, a great storyteller, and some of them were quite commercial writers like Gerald Seymour, but also Richard Ford, the great American novelist, Raymond Carver, great short story writer, Peter Matheson. Mm -hmm. So um, it was an amazing combination of both English language writers and writers. And I mean, and it is, it, I think until relatively recently, it was the absolute best list of, of great writing and translation. And as well as Pasternak and Bulgakov, it also had Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate, probably I would say the great novel of the of, of the of the Second World War, one of the great tell us, novels. Tell us again what that is for those of us who want to write. That's it down. Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate. Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate. This is one yep. we should all read. Apps, yeah, and interesting. More recently, the, a, a new a new book called Stalingrad. His book on Stalin, his novel on Stalingrad, has finally been translated. But Life and Fate is is I think generally considered to be perhaps the greatest novel of the of, of of the of the second world war and solzhenitsyn was also on the harvard list it's an amazing list of writers and you know more recently christopher had discovered P peter herg who miss miller's feeling for snow pretty much mm. started the what you might call the nordic noir genre of, of scandinavian crime fiction henning mankell was on the harvard list another great Sc scandinavian crime so great joyous and when i was there i got to publish i would say certainly three four writers that have remained important to me one was haruki murakami who is now we 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 published he'd been published once before in the uk but we published the wind up bird chronicle which was the breakout novel for him and then what's the name again list, the wind up bird chronicle by haruki bird. murakami yeah. Often he's, you know, generally considered one of perhaps Japan's greatest modern novelist. And that book again is another, an, another World War II book in lots of ways. Although it's, it's like a mashup between a, a kind of World War II movie and a Studio Ghibli film. He's the most, he is, what's if you've not read Ghibli Murakami, film? you should, you should read. And that's, and I would say. What's a, what's a Studio Ghibli film? So Studio Ghibli is Spirited Away. The great Miyazaki, Hayao Miyazaki, who makes the most extraordinary animated films, oh, of which wow, Spirited yeah. Away, Howl's, Howl's Moving Castle, My Neighbor Totoro, yeah. they are most fabulous, imaginative kind of, and also seemed somehow to be universal in a way, while also being extremely Japanese. Certainly Spirited Away so is So you got Japanese. to publish this guy. And so uh, Murakami has 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 uh, has that kind of energy, but also he's also a, 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 I think a great storyteller and, and and loves jazz. He's very so I published him and I published uh, what subsequently become one of my probably my one of my great literary heroes, which is William Maxwell, who was fiction editor at the at the New Yorker for forty years. So maybe I respond to Maxwell because he was a he was an enabler of stories. As well as writer of, I mean, incredibly beautiful stories. What um, what book by Maxwell should we read? You should read. You should read. So long, see you tomorrow. Which was his late. It's his last novel, published in 1980, and was it didn't get in. It amazingly, wasn't published in English until we did it in 1996. But Maxwell also wrote the beginning of his life, a book called They Came Like Swallows, which is one of the very small number of, of books that deals with the impact, in his case, direct impact. His mother died in the 1918 flu epidemic. But I got to meet Maxwell in New York in 96, the year before he died. And that was one of my great moments. But Maxwell was, it was Maxwell's porch in Connecticut that Salinger, J.D. Salinger, drove out to and read in one sitting the whole of the story that became Catcher in the Rye. So Maxwell had published, you know, the great heroic period, Updike, Chief, Frank O'Connor, 
of New Yorker fiction writers and then was a writer himself. So it was just an extraordinary quirk of fate that for some reason he'd never really been published properly in the UK before. So you, you, and then, you, and, you were a story enabler and you, you talk about this joy, this great joy, a joyous time publishing these extraordinary people. Yeah. I Why mean, don't you stay there forever? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Why don't we stay there forever? I think I had got, Christopher and I had a very good working relationship, but I think I was beginning to feel that, that the business wouldn't work as a business if, if we didn't do some things differently. I launched a paperback list. Christopher was very much the publisher. It was very much his, his, it was very much his baby and he'd employed me and then Rachel to, to help him. And I think we did, we, we, we made, we took it, we bought it out of HarperCollins. We made it successful and independent. I know. I think I was just at that point, I was at my, in my early thirties and he was in his late fifties. I can see now that's that, that, that what you want from life is slightly different. And we were not able to buy, you know, Christopher was very un, unhappy about dealing with literary agents, which again, I completely now understand and see why. So I just, I, yeah, I think it was just that I started to get frustrated and I, I was made an offer that I couldn't refuse and to go and be marketing director and deputy group publisher at the Orion group, which is about that stage, about the fifth or sixth largest publisher in the UK. It was a at a time, you know, we had young children. It was quite a big hike in salary. We just moved. We moved to the country in 1997. And I, so too. by the end yeah. of 1998, it seemed like a really perfect moment for, for me to, to do something new. And then that's what I, I did. We went and I went and did a year as marketing director. And then I realized that I really, I, I didn't really want to be marketing director. Despite I was the fact doing, that you, you know, I was doing campaigns for very commercial stuff like May Binchy and Penny Vincenzi and David Seaman, you know, who was the England goalkeeper. And apart from, apart from sort of refining my, I, I learned a lot of stuff. I suppose I learned how big branded published authors were were kind of how they worked. But the first possibility to run something directly myself came up, and they, Orion bought a company called Castle, which were large baggy company that did lots of illustrated books, practical illustrated books. Rachel used to say they appear to publish five different books on corn dollies. And I said, yeah, that's true. A huge backlist. Most of it, not very good. They had a reference company, but most of the language dictionaries had been in the deal had been taken off to another bit part, part of the business. So I was left with some strange reference books, including the amazing Brewer's Phrase and Fable. Oh. Um, that's, um, that's a good, for the, again, for those listeners who do not know this, go out now and order a copy of Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. All the stuff you've ever wondered by, where it comes from, it's in there. Go on. Uh, sorry, written, go ahead. written by an extraordinary retired clergyman, like many of the, the reference books of the 19th century are called Ebenezer Cobb and Brewer. And it is, it's, a, it's an absolute treasure trove. It is. So, uh, and a military history list. And okay. I was sort of basically given the job of trying to make sense of all this, which was, so I, 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 I th again, that was, we did a complete look at the brand and what it represented. And I got very excited in the history of, of Castle. Castle had been, John Castle had been a temperance campaigner from Manchester and he'd started with, uh, he'd started with tea and coffee. So the idea, I think, was let's keep the, the let's keep the working man's hands full of anything other than beer. And then he'd gone into newspapers and magazines, and then he'd gone into book publishing. And in fact, the Castle's Library was early prototype for what became would have become Penguin. You know, the idea of doing classics cheaply for working people, and 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 so I got quite interested in this. The, the deeper story of Castle, which had been lost over the years. And within Castle, they had Mrs. Beaton and they had Wardlock. They had other old publishing companies. That, so it, again, that kind of historical 
digging deep into history to find stories that illuminate the present. It was a very exciting time. And we I was fortunate in that I, the Weidenfeld and, Illust- and Nicholson and other distinguished English publishers illustrated list had been thrown in with mine. So we in, I inherited a, 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 some great editors and a couple of amazing projects. We had, I think, acquired two books by Trini and Susanna, who were doing a column call about telling people, telling women what to wear, basically, very kind of a, and despite the skepticism about that. I remember them. Yeah, they were. When I, when I, when I met them, I thought one day you'll make television and you'll make, you're going to be, you're going to be huge, which is more or less what happened. Yeah. And then also we had the lovely Michael Palin and he had come to us from the BBC because we had undertaken to do his book on Hemingway, which he really was a passion project for him. And he had enjoyed that experience so much. We got to do the next, the next two big books with him, which were Sahara and Himalaya. And Sahara, I'd, I'd left Castle by the time Himalaya came out, but Sahara was the only time I've ever paid a million pounds for a, for a, but it was, I think they earned it. I mean, it was earned back almost immediately, but also that my other, my kind of, in terms of one's publishing excitement, that was, the first Frankfurt I went to, Castle, I should say, was losing Frankfurt quite a lot book of money. Festival. Yeah. So Frankfurt is a is is a is a book fair where you we go to buy and sell rights. Really, it's not a place for the, it's not a place for the uninitiated. It's not a place for readers or for writers, to be honest. It's where publishers go and try and do business, and is amazing. And was set up by George Weidenfeld again in that after-war period, thinking. You know, we need we, books are what we need to bring the world together, and some part of that spirit still remained. But I knew that we had lost a lot of Castle was losing a lot of money, and had to, I'd had to restructure, I'd had to make to make quite a few redundancies. But I knew that we needed a big book, and that was when I was just by happenstance found a, a, a an American publisher called Chronicle, who had been given the rights to publish the Beatles anthology, and were looking for a British partner. And I had assumed that they would much more likely go to to a, a much bigger house than than we were. But in fact, I think such was my passion for the book, and possibly my desperation. <laughs> but that was we did offer quite a bit. We offered up three hundred thousand pounds, but it was, you know, people forget it was a thirty five pound book back in two thousand, and it was it went to number one, and we sold half a million copies. Pretty extraordinary. And that that was that gave us that bought us a bit of time to do other things and to it, you know to bring the, the the Michael Palins on and we we started an amazing under the mentorship of Anthony Cheatham who with Christopher is an these these are two extraordinary publishers that I've learned massively from but we reinvented the reference list I mean the idea was to do reference. I would now call it alt reference. It's the idea of reference list that's sort of written by human beings rather than by faceless panels of academics, which is where reference publishing had come. So there was the amazing Dorling Kindersley visual thing, but I was trying to find people. So I got, you know, we we were we did Brit, we did we expanded the Brewers range. We did Brewers place names. We did Brewers, which was sort of Brit, British and Irish place names. Um, and we did books of reference books of adventures. We did amazing kind of people's places, nations, you know, the idea of nobody knows which tribes live where, you know, who, who are all these people being mentioned in the Bible. And we commissioned quite a lot of very, very good people. We did amazing timelines of British history with, with, with a lot of very, very good, great editorial team. And that was, yeah, that was a, I also did. I published Jonathan Green, the great slang lexicographer we had inherited. And we did a book called The Big the Big Book of Filth, which was, you know, you'd love, which is just massive. All the synonyms for various parts of the human body. Do you have a favorite? We, that's too, yeah, that's too, I mean, I think. The I podcast, think the, you can say what you like. Yeah, no, I think, I think it was, there's something. I think the, the 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 idea of kidney brush for penis was was particularly kidney brush. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. 
Yeah. It's that moment of incomprehension. Before yeah, exactly. Then, the, then the penny that horribly drops. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, what was as fascinating as we discovered there were as many. Oh, you came up with that one. That's genius. I mean, it was just it was historical. That's the thing that and. The, so the idea was it was taking it was taking all the rude bits of of this extraordinary, amazing work of reference. I mean, one of the great reference works of the twentieth century. And if if I was if anybody was going to say, you know, surely one one person now can't can't actually run a run a, a serious academic reference book, then Green's Dictionary of of Slang it is one of the it's one of the great works, and it's still available. I think you can. You, you know, it's now a huge three-volume set, but I think you can still get the maybe the a version of the Castle slimmed down version. I don't think the Big Book of Filth lasted. I think but we're going to run that out was, and get it. Well, though. we sold. I think we sold. We sold. I made Jonathan money, which his his actual academic stuff never did. He made quite a bit of money on that. So, no, we had a lot of fun. And then you're going to ask why did I stop doing that? Well, you could have played among the kidney brushes forever. Yes, why, why not? What what happened was, as is the want in publishing, is Castle and Orion were bought by Hachette. Hachette, this extraordinarily large business owned by, which owns, as well as publishing, I think, Lagardère own Hachette and own L and also make Exocet missiles. It's the, only the French yeah. could come up with this insane yes. combination. Hachette actually published me as well, yeah. that the horse boy is published by Hachette. So or one of their many subsidiaries, yeah. So we had Castle was not yet quite out of the woods, although it would become very much out of the woods the year after I left. But it was on its way there, and they decided that they were acquiring as part of uh, that they were going to acquire Octopus Publishing, which were a specialist, very very good illustrated reference publisher, Mitchell Beasley, and various bits and pieces that. So, so there was a bit of a clash there, and they decided that what they were going to do was merge Octopus and Castle. So Castle would become a kind of an imprint of Octopus, and the Weidenfeld bits of the Castle were going to go back to Weidenfeld, the illust- which was, I mean, it was three, I felt it was three years of work that was now being brutally torn apart. And I went and had lunch. Anthony and I used to have lunch at a marvellous restaurant called Luigi's. We'd have the same on a Thursday. And we'd have Osabuco, which was very good, and a bottle of Hananao, which is a Sardinian wine. And then we would go through all the week's business together. So we had one of these lunches. And he's, I said, this is, he said, well, you, look, you can go and run Castle down in Heron Keys, which was like really long way down the can sort of canary wharf down in the london and as you know i live i live in great chew yeah which would have been doc three hours three hour commute or so So, or he said you can go and be deputy publisher of 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 weidenfeld yeah so i said well deputy publisher of anything sounds like a terrible idea because you if you remember anthony you made me deputy group publisher of the orion group but then failed to tell any of my colleagues is that, that that's what the job you'd give me was. So classic Cheatham. So we laughed and I decided, no, well, I said, what would I, what, what, if I left, what, what could you get me? He said, well, I could probably get you a, I make you redundant, give you a year's salary. So I suddenly thought, you know what? That doesn't sound like a bad idea. I thought I'm sure I'd get a job very quickly. And indeed I was offered very, very quickly. I, I told the, 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 the Uber agent, Ed Victor, that I was leaving. And he just said, Ed had done a, he was very impressed with a couple of the th- books that we were publishing. We did a big, beautiful science, it was called The Science Book. And it was a timeline of the most important things that had happened in science with really big, beautiful illustrations. And we, we were sort of, you know, selling that for 25, 30 quid, I think. And he loved this. So he rang Victoria Barnsley, who was then head of HarperCollins. And I got called in for an interview. And it, that turned out that they, were, they offered me a, a big job. What was the job I, they offered you? They offered me the job. of They were going to start a new literary division called Harper Press. And they asked me if, they, if, if I wanted to do it. And you said? And I, I said, yeah, sounds great. And then... 
<laughs> what happened was I, by this stage, was was obviously living in Great Chew and enjoying the joys of that. And then this legendary character who had lived in Great Chew, got married in Great Chew, and had not, but had not lived there for a while, had suddenly moved back into the village. There's a man called John Lloyd, who was famous as the, the early collaborator with Douglas Adams, the man who produced Not the Nine O'Clock News, and Blackadder, and written one of my favorite little books, which is The Meaning of Lift with Douglas Adams. I just want to pause there for a second. For anyone who's listening in the USA, a lot of you might know Blackadder, um, but if you don't know Blackadder, you should go watch Blackadder, the TV series. But if you never knew Not the Nine O'Clock News, which was a classic British comedy inheritor of Monty Python from the 80s, go and look at that on YouTube too, because it, it is a work of genius and only Brits of a certain generation know it. All right, back to you, John. So you, you meet John Lloyd in the pub, probably in uh, great to you. Yeah, well, John and I got on very well and that was, and he kept telling me that he had had this extraordinary idea and then wouldn't tell me what the idea was, but said it was life-changing. And then we, I told him that I was leaving Castle and that I was going to go to HarperCollins and he said, I'm about to go skiing. Please don't accept the job until I get back. Cause I think he said, I might have got money to do this thing that I'm doing. So I said, well, yeah, okay. When are you back? So he was away for a week. Anyway, we, when he got back, we went and we did have, in, in fact, a very, very long session in the pub. And that was when he told me he wanted to set, start a company that was dedicated to interestingness in all its forms. So I said, okay, but define interestingness. So he told me three stories. One of which, I'm sure, I'm sure I've told you all of them. Though. One of which was that when his son Harry was born, he decided he was going to read the whole of the Encyclopedia Britannica so that he would be the best informed dad. And he said it was so boring, so tedious. He got to the fairly early on to the the thing on basketball, and he said it was like it was it was almost like the article on basketball was constructed to not make you want to read it. And he said, right in the middle of all these, you know, court dimensions and rules, and there was this extraordinary story, which was that it had been invented by a Canadian and called, I think, James Naismith, who was entering a competition for a new sport for American high schools. And he had, you know, been sketching things out, ideas, and was scrunching up bits of paper and throwing them and, 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 you know, one of them went into the basket and he suddenly had the eureka moment, went out and nailed a couple of peach baskets into the gymnasium and basketball was born. But that isn't the, that isn't the QI bit of the story. The QI bit of the story is that for the first 21 years of basketball's existence, it never occurred to anybody to cut a hole in the bottom of the basket. So every time a basket was scored, you had to get on a step ladder and get the ball out. <laughs> so that. Oh, so it's a stately was, game, a stately that progress. That was one story. The <laughs> other they, was okay. you have. Did they, did, they, said, did the players have to carry ladders <laughs> over their shoulders as they dribbled? Is that why you dribble? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. It's a kangaroo have. So I said, I don't know, one? No, it's three. And he said, you know, how many, how many David Attenborough documentaries, how many natural world documentaries have you watched where this extraordinary fact is never even mentioned? And it, it does turn out to be true. And then the third one was, he said, do you know what a tardigrade is? And tardigrades are now big on the internet, but back in 2001, the, the idea of these tiny little water bears, moss bears, these little six legged creatures that are somewhere between annelids and insects that live on every environment on earth and are able, the extraordinary thing about them is that they, if you dehydrate a tardigrade, it can live in a state of suspended animation for as long as a century and come back to life with a single drop of water. So they are, so anyway, I was kind of, you can sort of see that this was already chiming with the kind of reference books that I was trying to do reference, you know, the idea that, that good communication, good storytelling is about getting people's attention and telling them things that they didn't know and making the world feel, you know, like a more interesting and wonderful place because it is if you look at anything however dull so one of the early i remember one of the early qi challenges we used to get was 
give me a name of your town if you think it's the most boring town in England and we'll come back with interesting things about it. Somebody sent us Chelmsford and we ended up doing, you know, 20 pages of deep research into Chelmsford, which made it sound like, you know, frankly, Venice. So, yeah, that was, that was, and I'm afraid, I remember going home and telling Rachel, my wife, that I was going to, I was going to start a new business with John Lloyd. And she said, but how will you get anything done? You'll just spend all day talking. And I thought, yeah, I don't know. But we, well, anyway, we did. And I think the, the QI TV show now is on. It's somewhere past P. It's on its way to, to, to ending the alphabet. And we did, I wrote and co wrote 10, 10 QI books with John. The first one, the first one was sold over 2 million copies, was number one on Amazon for six weeks and sold in 30 languages across the world. So, yeah, so I then, that was my stint as a, as a, as a writer. And then. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Director of research. So you, you, you're about to take the big paying job that's going to. Yeah. Also, you know, pay for your kids' <laughs> education and feed them. Then you go home and tell your wife, sorry, I'm not going to do that. Going to sit in the pub and talk to this friend of mine who admittedly does do interesting TV shows about interesting stuff and hope to publish and make TV shows about interesting stuff. Can you show us, I can see you that on Zoom, but our listeners can't, but I can't see the dent in your head where the frying pan must have landed. <laughs> is, it, you, is it discreetly it on still, the back of still, your head? You still, had, you still had fax machines back in those days. And I know Rachel did actually cry actual tears when that fact I sent that fact through to Victoria Barnsley and it is it is sort of true that I would have been earning back in 2001 more than I'm still than I'm still managing to earn today so but hey but we did well, but, we, made but, it, we did make a bit we made a bit of we had a nice there was a nice period where the book royalties more than made up for my that that was that and that did coincide with a period when we were having it was nice we were able to go three times with the boys to New Zealand when they were young enough to really enjoy it. But yeah, I mean, I would broadly say that for any of your listeners who are thinking about a career in, in books and publishing, if, if money is your number one priority, it's probably not the right industry for you. So let me ask you a question here because people will be listening to it. And when you say things work well, well, I paid this million pound price for Michael Palin's book back in the days when a million was worth a lot more than it is now. And there you are making a TV show called QI, which is still running, hosted by Stephen Fry. It's a big machine internationally. Everybody knows that television is well paid. One thinks about royalties and so on. So now you're going to burst our bubble. If you're, if you're paying these million pound book advances and you're helping to get a amazing TV machine and publishing machine like QI going, and you're not sitting there now as a privately wealthy English squire, multimillionaire from all that. Why not? Why the fuck not? What happened? Why? Why? It's just, this is, this is, because we want to live free, ride free. So sure. why does that money not go to you? Well, some, some, well, bits of, it, but yeah, some yeah. of it does. I possibly, I mean, I think there was a, I mean, there are specific reasons. I think there's, I think with QI, I had come to the, I mean, I still, you know, cause John and I are still very good friends and the books, as I say, still make small amounts of royalty for the books, but I think there must be, there must be something in me that requires a degree of freedom. I mean, I'm, I now, I mean, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, started Unbound on the, I hadn't really wanted to start it, but two friends of mine had said something has to happen about publishing. And I'd said, you're right. I, I left publishing actually by this, the time I left publishing, I was, I, I was fed up with it, fed up with all the, 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 as I think I, I once said, it sort of has bad karma publishing. A lot of people saying no to each other all the time about everything. But so the idea of using, I'd become aware in that period, which was, I suppose, 2008, 2007, 2008, I've been hanging around with a lot of the Web 2.0 people in, in London and I've become just aware of the launch of a thing called Kickstarter, which was seemed to me quite interesting, which was to get go directly to, to people to fund interesting creative projects. 
And it seemed to me, that I knew somebody who'd got a book, terrible book, by the way, funded on Kickstarter. And he was ringing me up saying, can you tell me where I could get it printed? Because obviously the thing with Kickstarter is you have to do all the fulfillment yourself. I thought, this is stupid. What what we really need is you you want to, you know, you want to set up a publishing house that uses crowdfunding, but that also offers all the other services, you know, editorial, marketing, sales, gets books into bookshops, because that's in the end where they will sell. So that's how Unbound started. And I, as I said, I was slightly reluctant to, you know, I was at that stage, QI was ticking along quite nicely. I was writing on the shows. And the books were still, I was still working on the books, but suddenly this new idea presented itself and it was obvious to me that my experience was pretty essential if it was going to work so I spent two years not getting really paid and then at a certain point I was able to pay myself a small salary and I've been mostly doing Unbound ever since. Um, now, un uh, Okay so this to, to the, you didn't answer our question earlier. No I'm coming about back. What why? You, you, okay so I'm why why are you why are you not the you is the is the wider people within well, the publishing world I mean, why are the publishers and the people working in publishing not making the sort of money that you would expect them to if they're paying million pound book advances here and there oh i think i think i would be making a lot if i'd stayed in tradi in, in traditional publishing i'd be making a i'd be on it but you know i'd be on a salary mm. i'd be on a good salary i'd be on a big bonus probably but i would have ultimately not be free I would be having to publish the kind of books that, and I, I think I'd already demonstrated that I didn't really, I wasn't very good at that. I was always interested in trying to, to find stuff. I was always really, I cared more about literary quality than, than commercial success. Sometimes when I, when I, you know, when I, when I, you know, like the Beatles or with, with some of the other, or with a, like well, my own book, you know, with the, with the book of general ignorance. I think I've got, it's not that I don't think I have good commercial instincts. I just think I have a very, very low boredom threshold. So I want the books to be both good and commercially successful. And if they're good and not commercially successful, I can live with that more easily than just working in a sausage factory, churning out big name thriller after big name thriller. So it's the, my own particular reasons for why I'm not more, in independently wealthy are probably to do with that's probably more that's probably a longer show to do with who i am and where i come from and how i never really grew up with anybody who had ever had any money so i've it never did, really but, I, but it's not just you i mean i think i think no, as you people say in people general in publishing think, don't do not get paid that well despite the fact that it's an yeah, industry this, that this, generates the a lot people, of money the senior people the people of my generation who stayed in big jobs in part. If I'd stayed in HarperCollins and assumed, let's assume I hadn't gone mad, if I, I would be now earning, I'd be earning a you know, perfectly comfortable salary to, to right. you know, I would own my own house and I would be, I'd be living, a, a, I'd probably be contemplating retirement, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I think that, I think independent publishers, it's much more of a struggle. It is just much more of a struggle because you're trying to, you know, you by definition, unless you get an amazing hit, which, you know, luckily with Unbound, I've had enough amazing hits over the last 12 years to mean that we not only have survived, but thrive and now make a profit. Right. So, but, you, uh, and you I may, still, you know, you may yet hopeful. contemplate retirement. It, sorry? You may yet contemplate retirement. Well, the only, if I, if you're going to ask me, do I, well, you know, which you haven't, but let's assume that you would, what, for, what, what is the, what are the things that you feel that you haven't done? I mean, the only thing I think now, which I said to you in the pub the other day, which I feel I have got to, it's the one thing I need to fulfill. Um, and I can, I can rest easy is I've never, I've never published a book of my own under my own name. <laughs> And I'm a good, I know, I think that is because I am a good collaborator. I mean, I enjoy, you know, I love the, the other thing that I've done in the last six, seven years is to, is to launch a, a, the backlisted podcast, which has brought me a huge amount of joy. So please tell and, us about that because so you've done the last 10 years of this unbound yeah, uh, crowd. Published based, some amazing books. And I, we've watched some of the books that you've done and they're yeah. extraordinary. 
for the listeners, go and check out Unbound Publishing. It's full of phenomenal stuff that wouldn't have gotten published anywhere else. John has published these books and that absolutely caucus. But okay, so but then you you've started this podcast called Backlist, which has so taken backlisted, on a life of back, its own. Backlisted is is an idea I had with a an old Waterstones friend, Andy Miller, who had written I'd seen him do a, a, a great he has a book called The Year of Reading Dangerously, where he he set himself a the task of reading fifty great novels in a year. As he says, fifty great novels and two bad ones. One of the bad ones was Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. But um, it's very, very funny, but also very clever, very, and I had, I had had independently the idea that why was there no John Peel for books? Why was there nobody? Tell us I'm... again, not everyone knows John okay, Peel. So John Peel was, John was Peel? a legend, legendary English DJ who used to play late night, kind of two hours late night, most nights. And many of the most interesting bands of the last 30, 40 years yeah. were 50 years even were discovered on his show so he was a kind of a tastemaker mm. and it seemed to me that that most of what was wrong with publishing was that there were very few places that you could go because literary literary reviews were getting smaller in newspapers and it just seemed to me that there was scope to do something where you had really intelligent conversation about books but that the trick would be not because nobody it's really yeah people like sort of people do like to talk about what i've discovered interviewing authors over the years is if you talk to an author about their own work they're often quite re reticent or sometimes just not very interesting if you talk to them about other people other contemporaries work they're usually not very forthcoming because they either haven't read it or don't want to, don't even want to contemplate it. But you ask them to talk about a book that meant something to them when they were, when they were growing up, or that they were that that's, that there's been a lodestone for them in their own writing, and you get an extra, you know, you barely have to do anything. You just get an extraordinary hour of, of the kind of intense, engaged, intelligent conversation which I think we all enjoy having. At late night over a bottle of whiskey or you know when we're when we're meeting old friends again who we haven't seen for ages so that was the idea and seeing andy doing his little talk which was called read yourself fitter i said do you fancy doing a pilot for a podcast i've had this idea and we so we did it and then again with the first book we did was a beautiful book by jl carr called a month in the country which is as close to perfection i think as a small novel gets and we had more or less the formula from day one, and we've now done 188 episodes. And we've been on sabbatical since Christmas, so the new backlisted episode on Graham Greene. There are no guests. We normally invite guests, and we get guests to choose the books. But we have had over nearly seven years of doing the podcast. Graham Greene has probably been the writer that's been most requested by listeners, and we're both Graham Greene fans, Andy in particular. So we decided we just did it with our producer, Nikki, but that's the first of a new series. And we, they come out fortnightly and we ask, as I say, we get interesting guests on to choose a book that they love. And it's, 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 it's that simple, but it's, it's, yeah, we get, we get a big audience. Now we have a Patreon, which actually is starting to make us quite nice money each month. So it's also, you know, what podcasting is like, it's, it's just fun to do, it's fun to do and easy to do. It's a lot of preparation doing because we have to do a lot of reading. I mean, we thought blithely when we started it, hey, we're well read. Most of the books we'll have read already. I would say about one in seven we've read already. I mean, the, what people choose. But it just means that we've been on the most incredible reading journey. I've read all sorts of things I would never have read. Um, and it, What stands it, out? What stands out as one that you would never have read that has been revelatory? <laughs> okay, there's ones that I would never have read. I pr I'm, I'm not sure I would have I would have read the English novelist Elizabeth Taylor, published by Virago, or the Elizabeth Jenkins, The Tortoise and the Hare, that Carmen Khalil, the great founder of Virago, came on as our guest to talk to me about, and the the the, the Soul of Kindness by Elizabeth Taylor and the uh, the Tortoise and the Hare by Elizabeth Jenkins, both novels of the 1950s written by women 
because of the ridiculous way in which literature is taught. Those are books that men of my generation might easily not have not not have read. And there, indeed, there are a lot we do. Are these done books? A lot are of, these books we should we should oh, all have read? Yeah, I mean, if you if tell you're us interested. quickly about those two. I mean, they're both they're both they're both basically portraits. It may sound like both one of them is set in a small town, Elizabeth Taylor. One set in 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 a in a village outside London, in, and both set in the nineteen fifties. Both with complicated emotional relationships at their heart and they are just immaculately beautifully written it's the the small detail it's the the it, the, the the surprising kind of character interactions i remember yeah there's, there are other writers barbara cummins amazing writer the vet's daughter lolly willows by sylvia townsend warner a lot of the i, I now see the 20th century literature as being very different because I've ended up reading Muriel Spark. I, I, in fact, I had to slow down on Muriel Spark because her books are so good. I don't want to run out of them. Anita Bruckner, another amazing. That so, at the same time, doing Alan Garner and Susan Cooper, and doing both of whom are are, are sort of classic. Yeah, I mean, uh, fantasy, and, and, English fantasy, English mythology writers. Yeah, for children. I mean, as as the stuff which I would feel as uh, and 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 obviously I've mentioned before William, the work of William Maxwell doing those books. All of those books that you would, I would naturally have seen as 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 part of the the stuff that I read and enjoy. I've I, there's a lot of other stuff that I've ever encountered that 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 I and I, I would say that the absolute moment for me with backlisted that that is it's not always obscure books or relatively obscure books. We did great expectations, and one of the reasons I wanted to do that was because I. I'd read it last as a child, you know, as an 18, 19 year old for my degree. And I've, I'd always loved that book and been terrified by the film, the David Lean film. And then I read it in my early 50s and I suddenly realized, oh, my God, this is a book about disappointment. The clues in the title. It's about your life not turning out how you expect it to. And no young person is going to understand what Dickens was trying to do with that book. Yeah. So it's 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 that, that that thing of how great books live with you, and you you know you go back to them and reread them, and find more in them each time you go back to them, which is a sort of definition of what literature is for me. Mm. A book that's that you get more out of the fourth time you read it. Mm. 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 I would say that about Lord of the Rings as well, by the way. Just keeping yeah. my Tolkien theme. And the Shire, where you're now sitting, telling us about these books. I'm not. I'm in Pembrokeshire. Oh, you are? Okay. Ah, you're, well, it's another version of the Shire. That's uh, sure. Yeah. It's, 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 the Shire it's, by the Sea. Exactly. Yeah, Shire on Sea. So with Backlisted, you've got really a coming together of yeah. this whole story where you, you've been gathering and enabling stories your whole life and including living in the place of story. And now here you are both enabling and creating story you've done qi the book of general ignorance by the way for everyone who's listening you should go and, and read it. it should sit in everyone's toilet it sits in my toilet it's the thing that you sit down you open it at random and it's going to be really really interesting you're going to actually pe people banging on the door and it also can i say if you if the, the one of those books if you're reading the, the book of the dead it's probably not the best title but the the, the, the qi book of the dead which is 69 lives thematically linked there's a, there's a chapter in there about people who kept monkeys for example but you know the first chapter is about about people who had either absent or complicated relationships with their fathers but it i think that's probably the most ambitious of the qi books that you did the animal book is very good but yeah but i mean the, the first the, the first one always has a sort of an affection not least because it's so it was so successful but it's 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 very it's very amusing now when i interview people for jobs who are in their 20s or 30s and they kind of all grew up it's like my own children you know they all grew up with qi qi is now part of the culture it's part of the it's part of the cultural furniture of a lot of a lot of younger people which you know in the long run if one's looking back on one's life that's that's a that's a really exciting and happy thing to have been able to to, to create 
and it you know the the the, the little me that used to sit in the northeast reading children's britannica kind of finding out interesting facts about birds it's been wonderful to be able to turn that into something that's that's both been successful also but i think culture we've made often people say to me you made being a geek cool you know qi helped make make people who were intelligent and interested in things kind of and not feel like they were weirdos so that's 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 a nice thing to think so now you're you're looking ahead <laughs> this is this is this is live free ride free and and you don't have the either the personality type nor the luxury of saying well now i'm contemplating with my retirement but also what would you do in your retirement other than do exactly what you're doing I, I, and I've more no, i have no use for the concept of retirement i, I can't I, understand it myself no more time more time for more time for reading and i i feel i've gathered together so much of so many stories about the village and i would love to try and weave all of that into something that would be meaningful so i mean i, I feel that's my if people say what's what's what 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 unfinished business do you have that's definitely that definitely feels like unfinished business and to having a bit more by time john to do mitchinson that. <laughs> i can see it i can see the series i can see the the downton abbey natural inheritance of but over generations and generations in different eons perhaps starting cre no I, this we I have think... not touched on by the way is your is your deep knowledge of the La English landscape, its history and its mythology and its prehistory. Yeah. I think that's, that's the stuff that really, I, I, when we were talking about the authors that I published at Harville, Rachel and I were really thrilled one day. We were a kind of an e email came around saying, would you, would anybody in, from, this is in Christopher's voice, would anybody be interested in reading the adult, an adult novel by Alan Garner? And I think Rachel's, reply of mine arrived almost simultaneously with kind of like yes and that started a, a relationship that we both had with alan and his wife griselda which has been and now with his daughter elizabeth and that's been one of the most nourishing and happy publishing stories we we published alan's book strandloper and then thursbitch and he is if you're i mean he is a very very tough model because what he does is so remarkable and it, he's lived in the literally in the same place for 60 odd years and catalogued every pot shirt every kind of t every find every every everything that's come out of the, the ground on that extraordinary site up in cheshire for and his way of distilling all that down into something that is beautiful and and meaningful and again like i say like a almost impossible to work out how so much has been compressed into so little so few words his his late, latest book by the way Rue, if you've not read treacle walker which was shortlisted for the book prize last he's the oldest person at 88 to be shortlisted for the book prize but that might be well i think it is his masterpiece a treacle walker which is alan garner yeah Okay. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty extraordinary. There is a whole backlisted on it if you want okay. some background. But it, yeah, I mean, I think for Rachel and I, that was, that was, that remains one of the great. And it's, it was, he was very instrumental at the time we moved to Chew and in kind of, in kind of making that seem like the right thing for us to do, which it undoubtedly has been. I mean, as a, I think we've said, it's living in one place for a long time is is it will always have its 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 issues but it's and you know the village as well as anybody <laughs> it's not it's not quite as relaxing and 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 quaint and as people might think it's it's there's a ferocity about it as well yeah which, as a quick aside for, yeah. the, for those listeners if you ever go to visit great tube in the uk it is possibly the most picturesque Oh, if it's not the most picturesque, it's up there in the top 10. However, and it has a legendary pub and this pub is called the Falkland Arms, which hasn't really changed inside not much since the 17th century. And you can still get a clay pipe stuffed with tobacco over the counter. And yet, yes, and it's full of bonhomie and good cheer. And as John says, it's well, uh, how would you, how would you describe, as you said, this ferocity, this 
Yeah, I think it's. I don't know. I think. I, I think some places, some places have a the the membrane is thin, and Chew is one of those places. And I think there is there's something it's, occult it's, almost about it. There is, yeah. yeah, and you know, it's there's there the, the that energy can 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 draw people into addictive behavior, and and you know, there's there are there are there are lots of there are lots of bad Chew stories as well as good ones, uh, and people who've come and who's who've who've not been able to cope with it and but you know it all all of that makes only just make it for me at least it makes it more interesting i suppose yes human human and yet sort of pre-human and superhuman this is, there's a, there's a skein to your work john too which is always that the supernatural is floating around the edges and sometimes running through a lot of the books you've recommended to me a lot of the you know we talked about the master and margarita and Mm. You know, it's one of the greatest works of magical realism and obviously by night under the stone bridge but some of my most treasured memories are walking with you over the oxfordshire landscape to the roll right standing stones and some of the other megaliths and listening to you explain and recount the stories of those places and the myths of those places i do feel that we would all be a, a richer <laughs> if you would put together a book that takes us through that landscape. And yeah, because you have delved into it so deeply while remaining so involved in the, in the world in general, but always bring it back to this, this one landscape in this part of England. When are you going to do that? When do we get to read it? It's a good question. I mean, I mean, I've, I've, I've probably, I've probably got to, I've got to assign some, some time to it. I think. And the, the interesting thing for me is that you're, what you, you're saying is right. That the, I'm fascinated by places, and Chu is one of the most fascinating. That, that, like I say, they just seem to have that liminal quality where you feel that you're on a boundary between one thing and another thing, and that, that, as I say, that, 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 that the membrane seems particularly thin there. And trying to trying to capture that in words and trying to make sense of that, trying to make sense of the fact that, which again, Alan does so brilliant, Treacle Walker, that time is is I'm not saying it's exactly an illusion, but it isn't what we think it is. It isn't a that 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 the idea of the present, past, and and future are so intimately connected that the you know the the past is as Faulkner famously said, is not even past, you know, it's, 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 it's still there. This stuff is still there. I mean, corporeally and physically in the form that we are, we may not be able to, you know, it's not like we can shake hands with Lucius Carey, but the, the extraordinary fact that the, the, every spring, you know, we just did spring in England and it's, it's that feeling of how is it that this happens every year? This renewal happens every year and has happened every year for, for, for a very, very long time. You know, it's, it's trying, trying, to, trying to find a way of, of capturing that, I think. And as you say, preserving some of those stories, because I think some of the stories, both, you know, the very old ones, but also the ones that have come, come up in the last 50 or 100 years of people who have lived and worked the land and gone mad or you know there's an extraordinary sequence of stories about a about a vicar and great chew who went insane or they say went insane i'm not I, again i think that's those are always interesting when people are described as being in, insane it's probably not what we think of as you know being carted off in a straitjacket it probably just massively eccentric or maybe in touch with something deeper or maybe in touch with something you know that was was terrifying and made him you know or maybe just depressed maybe just you know very 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 depressed so all of those it's interesting to me that 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 that, that these places that appear insignificant if you just or or you know that thing when you're when you're traveling and you're you're aware that a place has an atmosphere, but it's incredibly difficult to pin down yeah. what that is or why that is. And I don't know 
you know, I've come to the conclusion it doesn't really matter whether there is something imminent in the land, that sentient landscape idea, or whether it's your projections. Between the two, something is happening. Yeah. And I guess that's one of the things as I get older, I feel I feel it's 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 realizing that the not being explicit is almost as important as being able to try and define things precisely. That, that yeah, the sort of the endless great, potentiality the great, of the, the human the great imagination. Literature, yeah. The great literature doesn't contain a series of messages on how you should live your life. Yeah. It just gives you a sense of the complexity. And I don't know, I think it, it's it's that latent negative capability, as Keats used to call it, is so important. And that's That's kind of what keeps us going back to things. The non-resolved as aspects of it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think I'm. I think as I get older, I'm. I'm less interested. I think there was a period where I was quite arrogant about. Oh, I've I've sorted my stuff out. And I think, <laughs> yeah, well, be careful. Be careful yeah. of boasting about that. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, um, presumably, as long as we're breathing, there's always stuff. As the as the the, the proverb that I think is I can't remember it was maybe Persian proverb that we have. As the, as the main proverb at the beginning of the Book of the Dead is, he who is not dead still has a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm perfectly happy to have that, have that as my as uh, above my door, as it were. Although maybe the dead will say, actually, no, chaps, it's just much better over here. Yeah, you, you, that was well, all that's just limbering true too. up. Yeah, I think, I think, I think the other great thing that was always one of my favourites at QI was, and this is from Neil. Bohr, the great Danish physicist, he said the opposite of a trivial truth is a falsehood. But he said the opposite of a great truth is also true. And I think that thing of that possibility of two true things simul happening simultaneously feels to me like how whatever the universe is spun out of, that's what it's spun out of. Paradox. It isn't spun yeah. out of it isn't spun out of digital zero one, yeah. true false. It's spun out of the coexistence of two, of two true things. It's very all, true. Not, all not to exist in the same space, but do ambivalence. Everything is the is the opposite of itself. Well, he used to say. I mean, he has. There's a story about him. But a boar is that he had a horseshoe on his on his wall, and a student said, but. Professor Bohr, as a as a man of science, surely you you don't believe in it. And he says, "No, but I understand it brings you luck, whether you do or not." <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of that's that's my kind of story. Uh, well, John, long may you continue to live free and ride free, and long may the rest of us benefit from it. For those of us who've ever bought a book at Waterstones, for those of us who've ever read one of those books that you published at Harville for any of us who looked at Michael Palin's stuff as he was traveling, for any of us who enjoyed reading the QI books and watching the TV show, for any of us now that are reading the books that you're publishing in Unbound, which are extraordinary, to any of us that are listening to the backlisted podcast. You're one of those people, I feel, who, what is it? It's, it, you know, the Marcus Aurelius, I can never remember if it's Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus, either of those great Stokes. He said, yeah. you must be as the vine, you know, that you, you, you produce the fruit and the people and the animals pluck it off. And it doesn't matter whether they cut you or burn you or you thrive, you are as the vine, you just keep producing what nourishes everybody and that's you john well i we i don't know i that's very very nice of you to say that i mean i i think the i think the the if there is any kind of theme through these ramblings it is in the end that i'm again another quote that i love is that eb white the great author of charlotte's web and also yes. wit one of the sort of the Algonquin round table wits who said, he said, I wake up every day with two things in mind. He said, I want to change the world and I want to have a hell of a good time. He said, sometimes that makes planning my day quite difficult. 
I think that, yeah, the, as I said earlier, that maybe the low boredom threshold, it might have, that might have interfered at times with the, the, the getting and gathering of wealth, which is a very important thing. You know, it's important to be, it's important to be able to, to, to live without, without, without fear if you can. At the same time, you know, again, reaching for the, for the apatheme jar, you know, I don't think you achieve much within your comfort zone. I think mm. generally when people are, are trying to push themselves into do, to do different and challenging things, they, they, they do, you know, they do, they do achieve remarkable things. And I, the things I've done, I suppose, I, part, part of the thing I like to, to do is to have, as you know, I like, like people around me to be happy. Sometimes my, <laughs> my behavior makes that less 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 likely than it, it probably ought to but in general i think it's it's yeah when you when you go through the things that i suppose i've worked on it does seem like a yeah i'm i'm, I'm very proud of what, what i've managed to achieve and i'm still restless and still want to do other things mm. there are still i'm i was saying i think i was saying to you the other day i'm still i get those things the cities i've not but visited which i always thought i would and just when you get it to the age that you're, you're going to have to make a plan and go to the foothills of the Himalayas. I'm going to, I need to see Buenos Aires before I die. Well, yeah. What is, what is, what is the bucket list? Buenos Aires? I mean, to be honest, I, I, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I feel baffled that I've never managed to go as somebody who has always felt that when I was a kid, I used to stand on the end of Roca Pier and look across and think of the fields. I'm amazed I've never been to Scandinavia. It turns out that there weren't fields at the other side of, of, of the, of the North Sea. They were just sort of Danish sandbank. But... <laughs> yeah, right. On, on, the, um, on your way to the fields. Yeah. Yeah. We've, Rachel and I have attempted to go to Venice at least three times and we've always been foiled. So we ought to, we ought to do that before we, the, the usual stuff. We often have that, Rachel often says that if she went to sub-Saharan Africa, she'd never leave, which sort of terrifies her that she'd fall in love with it so much. She, she should never be able to leave it. But. We'll see. Um, we've, I've, you know, have spent an inordinate amount of time in New Zealand and by extension in the, in, we love going to Rarotonga, the Cook Islands, as you know. So I've seen a lot of places, but the world. Listeners, John is the only man I know who's actually stood on a stonefish and, <laughs> and did indeed almost die. And well, only a joy. You guys also don't know John physically. John is a mountain, which makes him very difficult to keep up with when you're drinking with him. But he has an, a physical resilience that I don't know if anyone else had stood on a stonefish, John. How long were you in hospital after that? It was, it was to be honest, it was, I was, it was only half a day in, in the hospital. The problem was it was the, the, the wound got infected. I had to, by the time we got back to New Zealand, I had to have a massive dose of antibiotics. But yeah, yeah well, they were talking but we about did taking get, I did get my revenge. So I, I took the boys, we, we, we were flying back from, from New Zealand. It was the stonefish was Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. And then we were flying back to, uh, through Hong Kong and we found a restaurant that specialized in stonefish. So we had stonefish three ways, which the boys were, they just thought this was the best bit of revenge ever. So. So sometimes one is mitigated. Oh, yes. Well, this has been very, thank you so much, Rupert, for this chance to, to, uh. to to meander through my life. And... It's, it's been an absolute delight and. What I want to come across from this is that really for listeners, if you, if you have a chance to touch any of these, touch any of these parts of John, if you, if you get a chance to, to touch our John in these ways, check out this legacy that he has of QI, the books, the show currently with unbound and check out backlisted the, the podcast. Because what all will happen is this, in the, is you will, you will, you will just discover treat after treat after treat after treat, fulfilling experience after fulfilling experience, great read after great read, belly laugh after belly laugh, pleasure upon pleasure. So John, thank you so much. Is there any parting word that you would like to give or are there also links that we should know? Um, no, I think, I mean, stuff? I would say, I would say that the do i mean backlisted in, in many ways has has the best of me and there are many many hours of of, of that by all means 
do subscribe to, to Batlisted because that I think probably has the best of me and lots and hundreds of hours of it. And also page, uh, on our Patreon, you can if you subscribe, you get a two extra podcasts a month, which we call Locklisted because we started them to cheer ourselves up as in, in lockdown where we talk about books and films and music as well, uh, uh, the stuff that we've enjoyed in the last few weeks. That's me and Andy, my co-host, and Nikki, our producer. And that's a different, and we play, we get, because it's not, it's not public, we get to play, we get to choose music on there, which is fun. And how do they find Locklisted? What do they need to uh, do? You just go on www.patreon.com forward slash backlisted and you'll find... Yeah, you can subscribe at various levels. So www.patreon.com forward slash backlisted. Yeah. Okay, you heard it, everybody. Go enjoy yourselves because you have an enormous amount of fun waiting for you. And that seems to me to be the whole purpose, really, of the whole thing. I, I've always thought that fun is the great underestimated human virtue. That is absolutely you know i think you're i've I've, it's funny i just i just found that great mark it's marcus aurelius be like a vine that produces grapes without looking for anything in return and i was going to say that's my if if i had anything to live under that's probably that probably is it actually really it's just yeah well that's you you. keep 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 making those grapes people all right I'm off to I'm off to squish the vat with my bare feet and enjoy Indeed. the price. <laughs> Till next time, John. Okay. Can we have you on again? Yeah, I'd love to. we'd love to talk more. We can pick up other stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, books, mythology. Yeah, all of it. All right. Then okay. till next time. Lots of love. Enjoy. Bye yeah, bye. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join our website, newtrailslearning.com, to check out our online courses and live workshops in Horseboy Method, Movement Method, and Athena. These evidence-based programs have helped children, veterans, and people dealing with trauma around the world. We also offer a horse training program and self-care program for riders on longridehome.com. These include easy-to-do online courses and tutorials that bring you and your horse joy. For an overview of all shows and programs, go to rupertisaacson.com. See you on the next show. And please remember to press subscribe and share.